thank you, Jimmy. That was uh, that was a great intro. I really appreciate that. <laughs> so let me uh, let me share my share my screen and get the Prezo up. Thanks everybody for returning after after lunch. I appreciate. Uh, well, hopefully some of you have taken uh, Gail's advice um, and kind of uh, done some 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 exercises, stretching and breathing to uh, to get yourself ready for the next part of today. So I'm gonna be talking to you about Recruitment 3.0, the human tech partnership. And before I get into that, I just wanna make a very clear statement. Leaders, this is absolutely for you. Recruitment isn't a process that you manage. It shouldn't just be a service within your business. It's, it's, a, it's a function that you should absolutely be immersed in, have ownership of, transparency of and, and really be driving. So before we get into recruitment 3.0, it's probably useful to give you a bit of context in terms of, well, if there's recruitment 3.0, what was recruitment 2.0? And I think that in itself was very much based on social media. So the, the rise of social media was, was certainly billed from a recruitment perspective as the, the, the next kind of generation of how we would we would look to engage, attract, and, and certainly onboard talented individuals for our businesses. It gave us multiple streams into different communities, um, and, and certainly with regards to the ability to push outbound content to potential employees, it was, it was going to be a game changer, an absolute game changer for the industry. And I think those that really adopted this perhaps back in 2012 2013 really started to win but unfortunately the majority of the recruitment industry probably didn't adopt it as well as that minority and a, a recent poll by uh, agency central kind of gave us a litmus test in terms of you know how important is social media to your overall recruitment strategy and i think it's re really quite interesting to note there that only 60% of respondents felt it was fairly important and only 20% felt it was essential. So that does actually give you a bit of an indication as to the individuals and, and th those groups that were really winning with social media and really worked out how it could work for them. But actually the majority were still probably struggling with how it could be or how those channels could be optimized. And on that same uh, poll, uh, that same survey, they asked, you know, how active are you on which particular social channels you're active on. LinkedIn, no surprises, I think, for a majority of leaders, LinkedIn is, is probably the primary platform. There might be a little surprise in there that certainly Twitter maybe came just after Facebook, because um, Twitter probably feels like a bit more of a premium platform than Facebook for talent acquisition. But actually, it, it isn't when you really start to look at how it can work for you. So what did, what did this mean? Recruitment uh, 2.0, sorry. What did, what did it mean for businesses? Well, the, the reality was that you had a digital face on the front of a business. So you had a, a, a recruitment process that offered different channels, uh, offered a, a, the potential for more engagement, more information, more transparency, more inclusion. But sadly, the, the reality was very different in so much as behind that digital face, nay, actually that digital wall, there was a very traditional recruitment process still underpinned by very traditional processes and very traditional approach to how somebody should be assessed, interviewed, and then on to the potential hiring decision. And I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples of this, this traditional approach, which I think will, will resonate with most. Job specifications were still written on the basis of experience, skills, and what we needed that individual to do in terms of the job. So i.e., what tick box exercises and responsibilities would they have? So you had a 2D very traditional approach to outlining an opportunity. With that, you had mounting 
application levels. So an increase in application levels through all of these different channels that you'd, you kind of outlined, increase in applications, and actually what suffered from that was probably the most key piece of currency for a potential applicant, which is feedback, which sadly, I think, really started to diminish the more channels we actually created for people and it, it applicants to, to contact businesses. And then what you essentially had was new channels, but only one way to transit or one linear pathway for all of these, these applications. So irrespective of the diversity, irrespective of the, 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 the different types of individuals, their creativity levels, the different levels of experience, skills, different things they were bringing to the table, they were all still being channeled through a very traditional recruitment process, which I would venture probably doesn't do them and all the company justice. And this is one point I wanted to kind of kind of bring up. Um, and it's not meant to be confrontational, but within a traditional recruitment process, um, manager's intuition um, and that, that kind of final decision that's left with a manager on a hire or not could sometimes dependent on their capability levels of interviewing. And don't get me wrong, trust me, being a really seasoned, skilled interviewer takes time, practice, effort, revision, reflection. And so at the lower end of that, manager's intuition on a hire was, I would always liken it to a really quite horrendous blind date where <laughs> you're just not getting the right information at all. All of the signals are being picked up incorrectly. So just to kind of surmise and stop us at this point, Recruitment 2.0 didn't really offer the gains that I think the industry as a whole anticipated and equally didn't really offer the gains that I think applicants and individuals looking for jobs were hoping for. As I mentioned, things like feedback suffered I think in terms of the process, you had a, a very digital front end, but a very traditional process still. And the, and, and the amalgamation of those two probably didn't deliver the, 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 expected, or the expectation and results that everybody was really, really looking for and hoping for. So recruitment 3.0 is the next step for the industry and I think for companies. And this is the very human first approach to recruitment supported by technology, not technology in front of that human first approach. And I think, you know, look, we'll, we'll certainly all agree uh, globally, uh, we've been forced to pause and reflect for a number of reasons at this moment in time both on a social level, on an economic level. And I think it's important to reflect, take that time to, to reflect on what was and what could be. So as a leader, what three things am I gonna leave you with hopefully today? The first is who are you trying to attract and engage and hire? How are you going to do that now? And what are the key considerations for you? So let's start with the who. And I think what I want to, to really outline here is, it's been often used as a, as a phrase, global talent. We have access to a global talent pool now. And yet, I don't think companies fully realize that because they put, geographic limits on what they're looking for. Case in point, companies that I have directly worked with will say, we, we have access to a global talent pool and yet they will still potentially second guess or pause on hiring or interviewing somebody based in Birmingham or Manchester or Leeds if the office is in London because the perception is they won't be able to travel into the office or they won't be able to manage the commute or they won't be able to sort of relocate in the time that we need them to. And as I said, recent developments have absolutely shown that 
now that we have had to work online, we have had to work virtually, productivity has been measured virtually, interactions and game engagements have happened virtually. It opens up the conversation for truly thinking about global talent and hiring globally. Because that's what you want as a leader. You want access to a diverse global talent pool. You don't want to have restrictions placed on you that are simple geographic challenges. And I think actually really thinking about how your recruitment process can enable a global approach will certainly put you at an advantage as a leader. Now, I mentioned previously in relation to the approach to job specifications and how they're written, skills, experience, and, and, and how a, a list of responsibilities are, are kind of outlined as the starting point for the recruitment process. I would say to leaders, pause on that idea because there are numerous reports, uh, McKinsey being very prolific around this, about the automation of job roles and something in the region of around 60% of jobs could be automated or partially automated during the course of the next 10 years. And with that in mind, if you have a number of job roles and functions that are changing, then surely you're already writing an outdated job specification. So what I would encourage leaders to really think about when they're writing job specs for, or, or certainly thinking about the recruitment process and therein what you're scripting as your key criteria for individuals you wish to hire, are the soft skills that I think are really gonna be far more valuable in a changing landscape of roles and responsibilities. So creative thinking will be absolutely key in terms of how companies, certainly startups and scale-ups, look to solve the problems of a scaling proposition, product or service. Even in an enterprise business, you will need creative thinking to understand and match all of the different elements of the business to find a solution to a particular challenge. Empathy, you need to think about how you can measure, discuss and table the subject of empathy in individuals, how you can put that particular conversation on the table because empathy becomes such an important part of a team environment and a, and a growing business environment. And that should absolutely be part of that holistic recruitment process. EQ, again, is something that's so essential in building and scaling teams and in any team, because in times of pressure um, and, and in times of stress, EQ, understanding the people that you work with and, and the individuals that you're collaborating with, well, EQ will allow you to find the solutions and continue to deliver and not actually reverse blocker and derail essentially what you're trying to achieve. Ideas, original ideas. How many interviews have any of us been into where somebody has asked us about an original idea that we've had and how valuable that is to a particular business? We should be encouraging those and, and the sharing of that with individuals that we're potentially looking to, to hire. And communication is far, far and away the most important asset, soft skill that any individual can have now when we're talking about a either a, a, a virtual environment or certainly an in-person environment. As, as Gail mentioned earlier, you know, the ability to convey your energy, the, the ability to build rapport and relationships in a, in, a, in a virtual environment does take consideration, thinking, understanding, measuring different cues than you would in an in-person environment. So actually getting a measure of that within a recruitment process is going to be absolutely fundamentally key. It's not sufficient enough now to just simply ask somebody about their communication skills and then perhaps link that to stakeholder management. How do you manage hierarchy? Because that, that's not going to give you a true representation of that individual. And in terms of finding different solutions, different pathways, 
to lead a business and thinking outside of thinking outside of the box, should we say, is another key asset within that soft skill uh, area of soft skills that's going to be fundamental to businesses' survival because the linear approach may not deliver the right result or it may deliver the same negative result. So when you consider all of those soft skills together and then you start to think about, generally think about the assessment criteria for that particular ideal individual and then you think about that in the context of the job that actually you want to offer and then you think about that again in con in the context of how you're going to convey those messages to potentially interested applicants you have a very different dynamic to a job spec with a list of responsibilities and that's what i want to encourage leaders to really start thinking about do not tread the traditional path because that will get you or that will result in hires that potentially will only have a short lifespan in your business before you're rehiring or looking to, to change the dyna dynamic of that role. You need to be thinking about individuals that can progress and change and adopt new skills and find new solutions and look at different pathways. So that brings me to the, to the how. You say, yes, Glenn, that sounds great. Um, how am I going to do that? That sounds like a, a lot to kind of consider. As a leader, you need to be front and center and present in a recruitment process. This is not something that you should uh, devolve to somebody else. It's something that certainly you work in partnership with your recruitment professional, but you will be front and center. So some tips to really get ahead of this. Well, let's start with how not to. This is my example of a, a firework. Um, like, yeah, I liken it to a, a kind of a, like a firework social post, essentially. C-suite individual has put, we're hiring on his LinkedIn or her LinkedIn page. They've essentially sent up a, uh, they've sent up a, a post which says, we're hiring and these are the list of jobs. Like a firework, it burns brightly for a short period of time and then disappears. It doesn't answer any questions. It doesn't offer any transparency. Merely asks you to engage without really offering you a reason why or actually answering any questions that you might have as a potential applicant. So this is an example of my suggestion. First and foremost, uh, Pankaj Sharma, uh, um, former colleague, great guy, head of business management at a company called Remitly. His first question to me was, Glenn, what, what can I do? How can, we, how can we generally start to really engage people and make them think about one, joining our business, two, joining my team? And the simple answer to that is transparency. If you look at multiple surveys, the one thing that applicants really, and the one person applicants really want to hear from is the hiring manager. So offering information up front, being transparent, starting from a point of empowering applicants with knowledge, with information, and putting yourself front and center. So I, they get a sense of you, um, in, in, certainly in this, in, in this video format, is gonna be absolutely a value add to that particular process. Equally, values. You need, to, you need to own the values. They can't just be a list of things on your website. You need to be able to articulate them. You need to be able to discuss them. You need to be able to reference them. One question I always have for leaders is you talk about values. Give me an example in the last week where you've seen consciously or unconsciously a team member act out or in a situation where they've, they've taken a value and illustrated how that can be used in the business context. Because if you don't have those examples and their they, values can seem very empty. And as a leader, you need to be an advocate for those values and you need to be able to discuss them and, and articulate what they mean. Now, this is another element where I think companies and, and do find it quite challenging. So this is taken from uh, the CIPD, which is, is, which is the governing body for HR and personal development. And they say the seven dimensions of job quality are these, pay and benefits, employee voice, relationships with work. And, these are the sorts of things that potential applicants are 
going to want to discuss and that you are going to have to disclose and you are going to have to have a either a policy around or certainly an understanding and appreciation of why they're important to the individual and be able to discuss them and articulate them again it's about that transparency it's about delivering value through the information and actually being very forthcoming in terms of your approach and this feeds into ultimately content creation so one of the challenges i think um and i reflect back to the poll at the beginning of the, the talk one of the challenges for a lot of companies i think because around social media is content creation they don't know what to what to create why to create it um, because they don't really have a starting point and ultimately what i've just outlined there are some key starting points that you can start to build content off the back of and actually start to share so by virtue of the things that you're willing to be transparent about and bring onto the table in terms of the recruitment process you can build content around that whether that's video based whether that's kind of 2d posts whether that's documentation you can create that and actually have that as your content to share and then social media becomes a lot more of a valuable channel it's not just we have a job so the what what to consider we've done the who and the how but what what are the key considerations for leaders when you're really thinking about underpinning this new approach to recruitment and thinking about that human first approach with tech supporting it so diversity and inclusion isn't a policy or process it's a mindset um, and that quote is from me because it is a mindset if you're thinking about diversity and inclusion as a policy process tick box exercise or a numeric value within your business you've already started from the wrong wrong starting point it's a mindset it's a it's a mindset of inclusivity it's a mindset of understanding people focusing on their soft skills understanding their drivers their motivations and 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 actually thinking about it from the perspective of the type of culture you want to create and actually looking at yourself self reflection and thinking what work do i have to do on myself to ensure that i have a very diverse and inclusive mindset and that can start with things like unconscious bias training um, and a number of other exercises that will really help you and that's where it starts from you as a leader you are the lightning rod for this you should not be delegating this to a function to develop a policy and a process it's something very meaningful and you need to own it culture now i want to come back to a point that margaret made this morning actually in terms of um culture and i took the quote here she was like how do you know a culture is improving and that that is the question for leaders how do you know actually before that how do you know you have a culture because you need to be able to articulate it you need to be able to discuss it you need to be able to share it you need to be able to discuss it with other team members colleagues if it's something that's that tangible you have a culture but make no mistake you don't own the culture culture is something that is organic it is owned by the people in the business it's there to develop there for there for them to interpret in the way that they interpret the world their perception is their reality so don't think that you can predefine culture you can contribute to it in a very positive way but you don't own it you can foster it but you can't direct it and one question on the basis of of culture and environment i always like to ask leaders is would you hire your best friend would you recommend that your best friend work for your company if the if the reaction from them is you are amazing this is amazing you should join us that's a good litmus test but if you have reservations about hiring your best friend into your business you have a question to answer i jumped to head aside there understanding recruitment so recruitment is a catch-all term for some 
get me a recruiter. Let's hire a recruiter. Let's, let's, let's get some recruitment in the business. There are very different definitions to the type of kind of recruitment professional you could hire. And that has a differentiation in terms of delivery, process, process improvement, strategic approach, policy. So when you're talking about recruitment, you need to be really clear about who you're hiring and for what reason. Now, as illustrated here, sources are very much at the delivery end finding potential interested individuals all the way through to a head of people that looks at the strategic approach to people, the policy, all the way down through to delivery. So you do need to be clear on who you're hiring and why to help complement that particular recruitment process you're, you're looking to put into place. And partnerships are key. Don't think of partnerships as recruitment agencies only because that would be a, a, it would be a mistake in my opinion there are a number of partnerships that you can develop that will allow you access to different types of uh, talent pools which will actually feed into some of the challenges you have across uh, the diversity of the people that you have in your business the types of skills that you want access for so three for here are three great examples co first girls social enterprise um, that is is driven by getting females into tech eric is addressing the long, well, very long, uh, and, and a legacy of poor career advice for creatives, and specifically focused on, on kind of uh, Gen Z, and doing some really interesting things around helping companies understand why perhaps they aren't accessing the talent that they're looking for, but equally allowing a facilitation of a conversation between people that are interested trying to get into the industry. Radical Recruit, again, a fantastic, uh, social enterprise that is effectively looking to help underrepresented uh, minorities getting into work. So that's people uh, from, uh, you know, kind of ex-offender backgrounds that, and they're driving this change. So when you have these kind of meaningful partnerships, you're really starting to look at a very different landscape when it comes to your, your recruitment process. And I guess to, to my, my, my final point around the, the virtual environment that we find ourselves in at this moment and some of the conversations that I've had both with peers and colleagues within the industry and equally with businesses is, you know, what are we going to take from this period of social isolation? Or are we going to take forward any of the processes, any of the, the things that we've started to do that we didn't do previously? And, and make them a, a kind of mainstay of the, the kind of overall recruitment process and things like video interviewing or purely constructing a process that is based on virtual um, hiring. Because what we have now is a dynamic of an individual looking for a job has a choice. They know now that it is perfectly possible to conduct a hiring process 100% remotely. Now to them that adds value because obviously it gives them time back, less travel. Actually they can make quicker decisions because obviously the timeline is moving more quickly and actually the time to hire could potentially be reduced, which is benefiting both sides. Equally businesses, when you think about the time and energy the leaders need to allocate to a recruitment process, video offers a really very good and positive solution to that, that, that dichotomy of time and time allocation. But therein in lies the, the juxtaposition of, I think a lot of individuals still want that in-person part of an interview. And I think we, we do need to pay attention to that, but equally I would challenge leaders, unless you have perhaps a, um, uh, some sort of uh, kind of gate analysis as part of your, your overall measurement of an individual, maybe some sensory analysis um, to kind of a gauge, gauge, you know, the, 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 the kind of potency of their, their aftershave, gate analysis in terms of how they walk, how they walk into an office, or maybe some sort of physical or, or, or sort of, uh, you know, sort, some sort of, uh, yeah, something that's focused around the, the kind of physical nature of an individual, like a handshake and the pressure of a handshake. Unless any of those elements 
are absolutely embedded in the assessment criteria, I would venture that you can get all the information you need from an individual in a video interview. If you immerse yourself in it, if you give your energy to it, if you really think about what you want to achieve, and if you really think about how you can build rapport and set the scene for this particular interview to get the most out of the interviewee, because that is your responsibility. They are not there just to answer questions. You have to set the scene and you have to create an environment where they are happy and confident to exchange information, really valuable information. And this comes into the, the assessment process. So now with a number of kind of virtual tools that we can utilize to make you know, video interviews a lot more engaging, virtual whiteboards, assessment tools, it, it does enable a, a very different format for the, the overall interview process, which could be far more challenging, engaging, and actually far more interesting for the interviewee. You do need to think of the stimulation factor in an interview process. It's not sufficient, because that, that links into how they perceive your company, how they perceive you. Do, do not make the mistake that a candidate, an individual looking for an opportunity goes into an interview process fully convinced that this is the opportunity for them. Every touch point they have with your business is either making them make a decision to take a step closer or step away from your business. So back to my point around decision making. Think about, firstly, the type of person that you want to hire and in its entirety, that person in their full 3D entirety, not in relation to just skills and experience on a job spec. Think about the recruitment process that you are gonna put in place, the, the, the assessment criteria, the journey, the candidate experience that is gonna be on offer for this individual. As leaders, think about how immersed you're going to be in this process, in both the creation and execution of it, and get to a point where you can make very informed and balanced decisions on the people that you want to hire. So I wanted to uh, sort of end my, my talk with, uh, with somebody who I find exceptionally inspiring, and I think we're, we're all looking for inspiration at this moment in time in, in, in differing degrees. And for me, certainly Barack Obama, former president of the United States, is, is somebody that genuinely inspires a smile, energy, attention, and you you are ready to listen to him. And if I could if I could set a a very high benchmark for any leader that wants to really be immersed in the recruitment process model yourself on on someone like barack obama somebody that really immerses themselves in something that that is exceptionally important to them and this should be exceptionally important to you because recruitment is about people and those people are in your business and i think that's that's me quite comfortably uh comfortably wrapped up jimmy i'm not even sure how we're doing for time <laughs> no you, you did very well mate it's uh it's only a, a a few minutes over but um i think it was um well worth taking the time because i think you hit on a lot Thanks. of things i'm sure we can all uh all relate to I've, I've yes i've been involved in interviewing for a long time and i can i can i can reminisce on on your description of recruitment 2.0 um I'm just going to, we have um, we have about 10 minutes, so um, I'm just going to uh, go to some questions now. I'm, I'm selfishly going to throw in one that popped up in my head um, whilst you were speaking, but uh, I won't leave with that because that would just be uh, too selfish. Let me grab um, some water. <laughs> yeah, so um, yeah, I'll, I'll talk slowly so you can have a, have a chug, yeah? Oh, we're good. Right, so um, this is a good one. Um, question is time is a key consideration mm. for any leader how can they manage their time to be present in the interview process without it being too much of a time suck 
Mm. Yeah, good one. Really good one, Jimmy. And this is where technology really comes into to play. So you need to firstly think about the, the, the content that you're going to share, the information you're going to share, the channels you're going to share them on, and then how to create that so it's really meaningful and engaging. Because, yeah, I mean, you, you can't be available for every interview, can't be available for every question that comes in from a potential applicant. But actually what you can do to better serve your time is think about the questions that you're going to get and offer that information front loaded. So it's either part of that initial job description, job overview. Um, there's video content that you can share and filter and, and sort of obviously share over a period of time around, you know, the, 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 the types of perhaps uh, cultural elements, environmental elements, the day to day of the job, etc. And, and I think it, it, there is also the element that you need to understand when it's going to be impactful for that one to one engagement for that in person engagement, that direct engagement, and all of these things need to be considered in its, in its entirety before you go to market and start actually trying to engage and attract individuals. So, as I said, technology, I think, can really be a facilitator. Um, and, you know, video is a great example of that, how you can utilize video. And we've been doing that over the last day or so, and certainly over the last week or so, to mm -hmm. share information about this, this virtual summit in terms of what we're talking about, the personality, the people, the people behind the subject matters. And I think that's really, really valuable. So it's, it's again, taking that into consideration before you launch that, that kind of go-to-market um, and, and start announcing you have an opportunity within your business. Excellent. Very good. I, I, will, I will go to my question, if, if I may be so bold. Um, of course. I introduced you as, as a sort of specializing in the, um, the, the startup and the scale-up recruitment mm. process or organizations in that phase of their growth. And I detected a few years ago a, a real trend against the anti sort of big company corporates from a lot of youngsters who were just starting their working mm -hmm. careers. Now, I'm, I'm too old to actually understand all the generations X, Y, Zs and all of that, but I'm, I'm sure you know it better than me. So the question I have is what, what do you think is different or unique about perhaps the types of candidates that um, are deliberately looking to become part of a, a startup or a, an early stage company rather than perhaps going into a, a massive mm. global 100,000 person company? Yeah, good question. Really good question. And it's, it's two things. How those large scale companies communicate and the language they use compared to how startups and scale ups communicate and the language that they're using. And I think probably what you're finding is that um, you know, so say for instance, you know, the next generation graduating from uni and, and probably prior to that, they are, they are drawn towards startups and scale-ups because they are talking a common language. They're communicating in a way that makes that, that kind of generation, there's a resonance in the, in the, in the generation, generational language. And I just know uh, Katrina's um, watching, so she won't, she won't, she won't thank me for going down the generational route, but there, there is, I, I do think there is that correlation. And um, one of the companies I referenced in the, in the, in the talk, um, Eric, they put together actually a, a, a zine, like a, an e-magazine and actually got feedback from, you know, kind of creatives trying to get in, trying to get that first opportunity in, uh, right. in the industry. And one of the things that they're, they're they fed back is that when they go to apply for a particular job at an enterprise company or maybe a you know a large-scale uk brand graduate approach the language almost makes them change and assimilate to what they think the company wants thereby distilling their own individuality and actually they also feel that perhaps some of those large scale enterprise companies don't value the broader skill set they bring together. So, or they bring to the table. So case in point, if you were, you know, applying for a software engineering grad, um, you know, kind of a graduate position, you'd be judged on your degree, any experience within the, the kind of software industry, yeah. they wouldn't necessarily take into account that you have a really uh, high engagement on a podcast you've created or that you've got a vlog 
talking about a particular area of specialism. These sort of things that actually are skills and show entrepreneurial approach and, and a real dynamism and, and you know, an ability for continuous learning almost aren't asked or considered by traditional mm. companies as something important. Whereas I think there's a little bit more flexibility within the startup and scale up environment because some of the jobs, as you and I well, well know, some of the jobs are just not well defined. It's almost like you come for one thing you, and then it's like, oh, actually, so you can do this. Oh, and you can create content. Yeah. Oh, and actually you can do this. Yeah. So there's an opportunity to really flourish and utilize all of your skills and experience. Uh, you know, what's the experience you have? And I think that's the big difference is, is it comes back to that traditional recruitment approach and what a company wants, not necessarily what an individual can offer. Yeah. Yeah, and I agree. And I think, um, I think from my experience to Margaret's point about predicting the future, often startups and scale-ups start a journey with a specific goal in mind and then events and opportunities transpire, which means they change yeah. to that, that multi-purpose, flexible, perhaps less, yeah. um, less sort of a cookie cutter uh, Definitely. approach. Yeah, is, is, is Definitely. Probably... because that, that's it is, you know, startups are not necessarily on a linear path right? They know that they may have to pivot. They know they will have to change. Now, somebody that's used to just being on a linear pathway, you know, kind of going through certain sort of levels yeah. of a job role, is not necessarily going to be particularly useful to them because they're not going to be, th they're not going to be to Seaham's point, they're not going to be curious, right? They're not going to be yeah. interested in learning other things. They're not going to be looking at different solutions. And that's what you need for the, to, to future proof a business. You need people that are looking to the future that are quite comfortable with ambiguity, can find solutions and are quite comfortable with being creative and tapping into that and see that as a value, you know? Yeah, yeah no, agreed. Okay, I've got another um, uh, question for you. This is, what, what tools can I use to automate parts of the recruitment? Pro I mean, well, how, how much time have you got, right? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I mean, to be fair, whilst um, I, I certainly could reel off a number of, um, a number of tools like there's Zapier and a few others. Um, one of the individuals that's actually sitting behind the scenes today helping us in the virtual summit is, is Will Sims. Now, if you want to talk automation, you need to talk automation to Will. I mean, he has got a, a really keen eye on how automation could be really utilized for the recruitment process, mm -hmm. but equally keeping that human element in. So I think, you, yeah, it, my, my advice would be don't start with the tool, start with what you want to achieve and then build the tool in to facilitate that. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. We've just got a comment come through from Andrew that says the hardest part is the right mix of skills, knowledge and energy um, uh, offset balanced with interest and, and commitment, right? And Yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, he's, he's right. Um, you do need to you need you need to try and calibrate that, but that's part of the process of discovery. I mean, it's it's interesting to me that companies um, will uh, you know spend a lot of time and expel a lot of energy in the discovery phase for a product or a service, yeah. but actually they won't do the same for a recruitment process, <laughs> yeah. which it kind of baffles me. So you do need to put time and energy into the calibration of that to really understand what's important and not just think in isolation. Because as you know, you're about to talk to as well, Jimmy, uh, and, and some of the other kind of speakers, you know, automation technology is, is going to fast become something that is going to be kind of really, really uh, valuable to us. But actually, um, I've lost my chain of thought completely. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we were just we were just talking we were just talking about uh, the right mix of skills, knowledge, energy, interest, commitment. Yeah, yeah. yeah and yeah. Uh, but so, let me yeah, let I me. Guess, I, I can jump in if you like. Basically. Yeah, because yeah. <laughs> um, I think what's interesting. I was just thinking as you were speaking, we talk about the cookie cuts, and if we maybe try and link some of the themes, Margaret's point around optimizing. A process for efficiency, which is, you know, that is what some organizations see recruitment. Um, Bettina posted a, a point around, you know, engaging versus, you know, why is it, it's difficult to engage our minds, but it's easy to write a process. And it's almost like we, we want to standardize it, we want to cookie cutter it, because if we can templatize everything, then we can go quickly. But 
perhaps going quickly when it comes to recruitment, yes, speed is important, <clears throat> but so is the individual approach in order to get the best possible yeah. outcome. Right? <clears throat> I would I would counter that in so much as the cookie cutter approach gives you a short term view. So you yeah. can you can templatize it uh, for a short term view, but actually, is it going to give you an ability to scale? Yeah. So I, you know, that that initial kind of template of a person that you want to hire, well, actually, what's with respect, kind of what's the what's the the lifespan of that person in your business? Do they have the ability to adopt new skills? Do they have the ability to to kind of self propel their own learning? Um, do they have the curiosity and imagination and creativity to look at other solutions within your business? So yeah. I think that was the point I was trying to get to previously when I lost my chain of thought. But that's it. It's kind of you need to think about that blend of skills and experience along with the soft skills, because that's the piece I think is going to really future proof your business. Right. Excellent. Just a couple of comments that have popped up in the, in the Q and A in chat. So, um, uh, yeah, automation is great, but, uh, costs lots of time, template processes, simple ideas are very short sighted recruit should deliver beyond the simple, which I think is, is we absolutely agree. And, uh, and it pays to invest the time because your people are more likely to stay if they are the right fit. I must say, no matter, I've had some, we've all been there in, in our various um, guises in, in you know, roles we've done, but I've had weeks where I've had to do 15 or 20 uh, interviews in a week, you know? Mm -hmm. And so by the time you look at preparing, it's usually an hour, the follow-up notes, it, it's pretty demanding. Um, but I must admit, I, I try and I try and approach every single interview as if it's my only one for the week. And I think yeah. if, if the individual leaves with a bad view of who I'm representing, and I did about six interviews last week for one of the companies I'm working with, then that's worse than not having an interview. So, so I always try and mm -hmm. make sure that not only do we get to understand their aspirations, um, but they also understand our vision, our culture, our values, mm. because I think it's just as important that they choose an organization and it's, mm. it shouldn't be a master slave. We're going to pick you from the crowd. It should be, you know, is Definitely. this a mutually beneficial partnership? Yeah. So, and it, equally yeah. as well, you, by not providing more information at the beginning of a process, you're not giving individuals much opportunity to self-select in terms of, you're actually asking them to come into a recruitment process to learn more to make a decision. Yeah. Um, and equally as well, you could be interviewing those six or seven people and with respect, you know, five of them might be thinking, well, actually, this is not quite for me. Or some of the questions I'm, I, I want to answer, I've got to wait to the next stage to ask them. Yes. And actually that could be, you know, when you talk about time efficiency, I'm thinking about both parties here. I'm thinking about yeah. you as an interviewer and that individual taking out time to be interviewed so by providing a lot of information up front and being really transparent and vocal about what your business is about and kind of what what fully holistically encompasses you're giving people more information to select against more so they actually have more information to index their interest on than just a set of responsibilities that they think that they can deliver against 